And the first thing we're going to do is kind of a, a nice little summary, if you will, on dual and designated agency. Um, did you guys get a chance this weekend? Since we didn't have any fun, did you guys get a chance this weekend to spend time on agency? Better, better grasping it, better wrapping your brain around it. Guys, I'm telling you, that little light bulb's not going to click after hearing it once. You want your agency light bulb to click, you need to go over it again and again and again until it does click. So where we left off, good review. We, um, of course, we talked last week about the importance of Rule 58A.0104. Uh, that's in our online learning system under the Campbell folder. One of the rules that I do ask you guys to read. And this addresses dual agency, designated dual agency. So it's another way to help you guys expose yourself to the information. So let's first start just a quick review. Everybody show me. In dual agency, how many firms are involved? In dual agency, how many firms? Just one firm? How many transactions? One transaction. So we're all talking about, for example, one, two, three Main Street. How many clients? Two clients is the simplest breakdown I can offer you. Dual agency is one firm, it's an in house transaction and two clients. Dual can be one or two brokers, designated as always two. We talked last week about a little bit about creating dual agency. Remember, it's intentionally created with informed written consent. So dual agency doesn't just accidentally happen. We don't just start acting like a dual agent. I think one thing we were all in agreement on last week, dual's not best. What's best for the client, is it? Dual is not what's good for them. It's good for the transaction. It's all right for the firm, but it's not what's best for the client. One way we can protect the client is to offer them informed written consent. Let them know what they're getting into should they agree to do this type of relationship. And we talked about meeting with the seller and getting their consent to do dual or not. Uh, we talked about meeting with a buyer and then later in your relationship with the buyer, one of your firm's listings comes on the market and making sure that we have these conversations at that time. Sometimes you guys with the consumers in dual agency, this is something we, we may need to revisit a couple of times. Let me ask you guys some, all honesty. When we went over dual agency last week in class, did you get it? Did it click? Do you feel like you were a dual agency expert and you were good to go? I, not, I mean, kind of maybe, but put yourself in your buyer's and seller's shoes. When they're hearing it for the first time, are they fully understand? Are they getting it? And, and I mean, that's our, becomes our job to explain it to them. It's not their job to know my job. It's my job to know my job. And with the consumers, you know, we, again, we talked about that buyer that you've been with, for example, six months, showing them property. My HGTV people, you're going to show them more than three houses. I promise you. So you've been with them for six months. <laughs> And all of a sudden your firm lists, you haven't talked to him about dual agency in the last five and a half months. And all of a sudden your firm lists something that they're interested in. Don't you think it would be a good idea to revisit dual agency? Make sure that they're okay. Make sure that they're good before we proceed. Um, especially if we may need to convince them, you know, to change their mind. So I guess my point is that when it comes to explaining dual agency to the consumer, it's not always a one and done. We may have to address it per situation to make sure everybody's good with it, to make sure everybody's on board. So let's say, let's pretend for a second. Remember, you guys are all affiliated. Y'all got your license, yay. And you're all affiliated with Julie's Real Estate Shop. And let's say we have sales meeting tomorrow morning. So you guys all come into the office. I get donuts, you know, and you come into the office and uh, we're going through sales meeting and I'm sitting there and I'm talking about our upcoming events and, you know, this is what we're going to do. And as an office and da, 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 go through our meeting. 
And then I look at you guys and I say, does anybody have a new listing coming on the market that you'd like to share? And one of you pops your hand up and you say, ooh, ooh, later this week on Friday, I'm gonna list something uh, located in Davie County and it's a three bed, two bath. It has a garage, cute as a button. I'm, or you are standing here describing the property. Do we have any conflict if we're talking about the property? I'm telling you how many beds and baths, I'm talking about a garage. Are we, is there any kind of conflict of interest or confidential information about the consumer that I'm sharing? No, we're just chit chatting about the property, right? You could go to Zillow and pull all that up on the internet, right? We can talk about the property all day long. The problem is, is when that conversation switches gears into the people. Now let's say you're talking about your new listing, talking about the property. Maybe I'm not a good Bic and I'm not paying attention and I'm back here getting me another cup of coffee and you keep going. Man, my seller, they really got to sell. They got themselves in a situation where if they don't sell within a couple of weeks, they're going to have to pay you know, the bank so much more, da, 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 whatever. Did every one of you in sales meeting just learn something confidential about our seller? Did you just learn something about their motive, about their point of selling? So guess what? None of you can be designated. If you attended sales meeting and I allow one of you to run your mouth and switch that conversation from the property to the people, what that means is none of you can be designated. Because remember one of the caveats of designated is you can't be designated if you've learned prior confidential information about the other side. So when you're bringing the buyer, and let's say you did get designated, you're bringing the buyer in and your buyer wants to make an offer, aren't you supposed to look at your buyer and say, well, I know they got to sell within six weeks or else they're in a situation with the bank. So if they don't drop this thing, then they're going to, is it your buyer going to use that to their advantage? Aren't they going to use that as part of their negotiation power? So guys, that's what we mean. We can talk about the property all day long. No problem. We need to be very, very careful when we're talking about the, the, the people. Truth is, dual agency says we can all stand around and chit chat about our clients because we all represent that client. In practice, you may want to not do that because in practice, you're eliminating yourself and all your other peers from being designated. Does that make sense? So I think we need to be really careful. I know that was a big question last week. How do we learn confidential information about the other side? And the truth is, it doesn't matter. You could know them personally. Maybe they were a former client of yours. Maybe the agent ran their mouth in sales meetings. It doesn't matter, I call it water cooler gossip. So if you engage in water cooler gossip, so it doesn't matter how you learn about the other side. The point is, is once you know something about the other party in the transaction, you cannot be designated. So be very careful with what you say. And that gets us to the bottom of page 163 which is a nice little summary, a nice little recap. They call it important points. In designated dual agency, dual does not go away. Remember our picture. So we got the buyer on one side, the seller on the other, the firm and all the agents in the firm are straddling the wall. Everybody's offering full equal service to the buyer and the seller. This is what dual agency looks like. In designated, one agent gets kicked off the wall to work exclusively with the buyer and a different agent get kick, gets kicked off the wall to work with the seller. But look at where the firm and all the other agents are. Did the firm and all the other agents get kicked off the wall? They're still there straddling it. The firm and all the other agents are still in dual. It's only one agent that has been designated to work with the buyer. 
it's a different agent that has been designated to work with the seller. So in designated, dual does not go away. Dual remains. Designated is a form of dual. In order to practice designated, in order to do designated, first off, the firm has to have a policy. We'll see that again in just a second. But the second piece of it is that we have to first get a yes to dual before we can get consent for designated. We first got to get a yes to dual. And then we get a yes to designate. If they say no to dual, designate is not an option. Uh, we're going to look this week. We're going to get into our agency agreements, our listing agreement and our buyer's agency agreement. And we looked at those briefly last week before we left. And one thing, they made a change to our forms last July. And one thing that they did, I thought the forms committee did a much better job of indicating on the form that if you don't say yes to dual, designate is not an option. So we got to get yes to dual before we can do designated. Um, dual designator only in in-house situations. How many firms in an in-house situation? How many firms? Just one. That's what we know about basic dual agency, right? One firm, one transaction, two clients. So it's an in-house. We have to have written approval of both no later than we're ready to make the first offer between uh, on behalf of our buyer. In just a bit, we're going to talk about an opportunity that we have to work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement. We can work with buyers under an oral agreement, but I got to get it all put in writing before I'm ready to make an offer on their behalf. So we're getting to that oral buyer agency. Um, with dual and designated, the individual agent that's been designated, this, these guys down here that have been kicked off the wall, they're now working exclusively one for the buyer and the other for the seller. That's one way we can offer our clients that exclusivity. They don't get that in dual agency. But if the firm offers designated, if we can all practice designated, and once these agents have been kicked off the wall, these two agents, this one and this one, these two agents, they might as well proceed as if they were with two different firms. That's what we mean by um, the individual agent has that exclusive representation, one for the buyer and another one for the seller. As we've been saying, and guys, I think this is a problem topic. We're all in agreement. Dual's not good for the client. Designate is much better. Yes. And I think our hearts, I think what we're led, because we all agree that designated is a better option for the client. And I think our heart, we all got big hearts. And I think we all just want to automatically assume that designated is going to happen because that's what's best for them. We can automatically just jump right into designated. Not all firms offer designated. If the firm doesn't offer designated, then it's not an option to the client. We talked last week about the different types of agency, single agency and dual agency and designated dual and sub agency. Blah, 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 blah. Your firm may choose to offer some or none of those. They can pretty much operate and run however they want, as long as they're not in direct violation of license law and commission. So we have to have a company policy in place. The company has to um, have listed, if you will, company policy about how they plan to practice designated. It doesn't just happen. We said the broker, the individual cannot be designated if they already have confidential information about the other side. The other side. So the agent that's been working with the buyer, they're going to look, the big should look at that agent and say, do you have anything confidential about my seller? That's what we mean by the other side. The agent that's been working with the seller, the big should look at them and say, do you know anything confidential about my buyer? 
And if they say yes, they can't be designated. You cannot go into a designated situation with prior confidential information about the other side. Because remember, once you're kicked off that wall, you now have exclusive representation. And I tell everything to my client, right? So the BIC needs to protect their both clients and make sure the agents don't have this confidential information once they've been designated. Once you have been designated, once you've been kicked off the wall, anything you learn about the other side, you owe it to them to tell them. Remember what we just said, those two agents are proceeding, they might as well be with two different firms. Julie's real estate shop, and we'll just call them the other guys, are us. Two different firms. That's what we mean by that exclusive for the buyer, exclusive for the seller. And then the last point we have here again, this second bullet is probably the biggest problem topic in this unit. The provisional broker and the broker in charge cannot be designated opposite of each other. Given the very nature of their relationship, the BIC should know something about the provisional broker's client. The BIC helped the provisional broker <clears throat> prepare for the appointment. They may have even been there at the listing appointment or the buyer consultation with the buyer, with the provisional broker. They're coaching and guiding. And based on just the nature of their relationship, they cannot be designated opposite of each other. They can be in dual together. They can be in dual together. They cannot be designated. Any other combination is allowed. A PB can be designated opposite of a PB, a broker designated opposite of a PB. Any other combination that you can think of is allowed as long as either side doesn't have prior confidential information about the other party. <laughs> We're gonna get into in just a bit, we're like two slides away. We're gonna get into um, my agency disclosure, my opportunity to disclose my agency status to the public. I get asked a lot, when do we have these conversations, right? Well, agency disclosure is coming up next and we need to have them early going into it. Uh, let's say, so in the chat, when you say they can be together, meaning together either with the seller or the buyer, um, they can't be what I say, what I mean, so we have our dual agency wall, the firm and all the agents straddling the wall, buyers on one side, their agent happens to be a provisional broker, sellers on the other side, their agent happens to be the broker in charge. This relationship, this type of designated dual agency is not allowed. They can't be designated opposite of each other. Anything else is allowed as long as this provisional broker doesn't have any prior confidential information about the other side, about the seller. This provisional broker or broker or whomever doesn't have prior confidential information about the other side the one working with the buyer. That's who the other side is. If you've been working with a seller, the other side is the buyer. If you've been working with the buyer, the other side is the seller. And your BIC should, there, the company policy in place, this is how your BIC is gonna handle this. How are they gonna make sure that they properly designate? I've had former classes ask me, and I'm not gonna lie, it concerns me a little bit, but I've had former classes look at me and say, well, what if I lie to my BIC? What if I have prior confidential information and they ask me and I lie, I say, huh? -uh. All right, guys, don't lie, right? <laughs> That's never good. You're never allowed to. But if and when 
it's discovered if and when you're caught, you'll probably be asked not to affiliate with that firm anymore. They'll probably ask you to go somewhere else. And I don't know what else they could do. Maybe they could file a disciplinary action at the Real Estate Commission. Maybe they could take you to court if you've harmed their people, right? I mean, you harm their buyer or seller by you lie. So first off, everybody, let's just all give me a thumbs up. Julie, we're not going to lie. Lying's never good. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Always bothers me when you guys say, well, what if I lie? Don't lie. How about that? There you go. Dual and designated, dual agency, designated agency. Again, you guys, I think the more time you spend with, I gave you several resources for last week and I'm going to give you a few more, right? We're just easing you into it. But the more you can expose yourself to this stuff, the better it's going to click the faster it's gonna quick click, as long as it clicks before test day. The last type of agency relationship that we're just gonna briefly mention is relationship and rentals, the relationship between the owner and the property manager. The property manager is the broker and the owner is hiring the property manager to manage their rental property, to manage their investment properties. It's really rare for a tenant to be represented in a residential lease. I'm not saying it can't happen, I understand. I'm telling you, what we see the most often, what is the most common is that the owner hires the property manager to manage their property. Uh, remember, I got a whole unit dedicated to property management, unit 12. Property managers really need to be careful because they walk a fine line. In this type of situation, owner hires a broker to manage their property. Who is the tenant paying rent to every month? Who is the tenant calling when they have a repair or something's broke or they need something fixed? Who are they calling? The tenant's calling the property manager. The owner doesn't want to deal with them. That's why they hired a property manager, let somebody else. And the property manager always needs to remember where their loyalty is. They need to remember that the owner is in first class, the tenant's back in coach. Isn't it in the best interest of the property manager to collect rent for his owner? Isn't that in the best interest of the owner, I should say, to collect rent? Isn't that in the best interest of the owner to handle repairs, any required repairs, da, da, da? That's why the property manager does it, because it's what's in the best interest for the owner. It's not what's in the best interest for the tenant. And again, property managers need to be careful because you tend to form relationships with tenants because that's who you're communicating with. That's who you're talking to. We're gonna get more into property management. I think I've said that now three times, unit 12. Um, so we'll definitely revisit that and see that relationship. All right, so now let's talk about our agency disclosure. If or when you spend time with 58.8.0104, you're going to see in this commission rule that it talks about your agency agreements and your agency disclosures. We owe it to the consumer to disclose our agency status. Let's all remember the Real Estate Commission's main purpose is to do what? Their main purpose is to protect the public. Isn't the consumer the public? Doesn't the consumer have the right to know where you stand? Doesn't the consumer have the right to know? I don't know you confidentiality if you don't hire me. Don't they have the right to know this? Again, you guys, they don't know our job. That's my job to know my job and explain it as I need to to them. So how we make sure that we inform the consumer. How we make sure that we have these conversations is doing our working with real estate agent disclosure. 
The whole point of this form is to understand that the consumer understands as soon as possible, careful what you tell me, because whatever you tell me, I've already been hired. I have a duty. I have loyalty to go back and share with my client. Now, I need you guys, I know you're writing really fast and furious, but I need you guys to listen to something really quick. The working with real estate agent disclosure is not a client form. The working with real estate agent disclosure is a consumer form. This is like the first thing we're going to do. The whole point is to let them know whose team I'm on. Let them know who I represent. I can never assume that they'll assume. And this disclosure gives me the tool I need to tell them. Let's imagine I have a listing. Everywhere this listing is advertised, my name is attached to it, my firm and my name. And let's say I'm doing an open house on Sunday. There's a for sale sign in the front yard that has my name on it. You walk in the front door and I'm wearing a name tag with my name on it. I say, hi, I'm Jilla Campbell. It may sound clear for them to assume that I represent the seller because I'm attached to everything in this listing, in this uh, listing. But we can't let them assume that. We need to make sure that they understand very early that in this transaction, in that example, I represent the seller. And I don't know you confidentiality. When you're talking to me, you might as well be talking directly to my seller. If you wouldn't say it to them, then don't say it to me. The working with real estate agency disclosure does not create agency. Agency agreements create agency. The disclosure simply discloses my status. And there's a point in time that I have, we're going to talk about next, this is idea of first substantial contact. And I'm getting there. We'll talk about that. But we have this duty to kind of warn the consumer, let them know up front about this no confidentiality thing. I represent the seller. That's where my best interest is. Second bullet point is probably the biggest problem topic of our working with real estate agent disclosure. It's mandatory with all sales transaction, residential sales, commercial sales. We do this disclosure when we first meet a potential buyer consumer or a seller consumer. Please make sure you see this. We do not have to do the disclosure in lease transactions. Lease transactions, we're dealing with landlords and tenants, right? We're not dealing with buyers and sellers. You may see a test question. They're going to try to trick you. And you may see a test question that says it's required with all real estate transactions. What's that word all mean? Every single one of them, right? Is that right? Are they required with all transactions? No, they're just required with sales transactions. They're not required with lease. Thus, they're not required with all. So when I'm talking about a sales transaction, again, residential sales, commercial sales, one way or another, you're helping a buyer buy something, maybe it be a home or a commercial building, or you're helping a seller sell something, or you're in that transaction. So it's mandatory with all sales. I briefly mentioned, we have this duty to give and review the working with real estate agent disclosure at first substantial contact. So let's talk about this idea of first substantial contact. Why don't you guys tell me in a private chat, when you see the word substantial and keep it, you know, keep a bit, I know what you mean. When you see substantial, what, what do you think? What, what do you think about with substantial? Something of substance, something that's important, 
something that's significant. Something meaningful. If we're discussing something substantial, if the conversation switches gears to something substantial, that means that I am asking or the consumer is re revealing, telling me information about themselves and how it can affect them in this transaction. It's all about this transaction and it's all about something substantial. I really, I, I do care what you guys had for lunch today. I, I care. But as far as how it relates to this transaction, is that substantial? What about if you come to my open house and we start talking about the weather? Man, it was good to see the sun today. Did I just learn something substantial about you in this conversation? No. So we can have conversations with the consumer. They don't all lead to something substantial. Commission rule says that we have a duty to present these disclosures before we hit first substantial contact. I would say in a perfect world, we'd be on top of this. In a perfect world, we would always stop the consumer. We'd always catch the consumer before we bump into something substantial. Shake your head yes or no. Do we live in a perfect world? No. Here's the deal, you guys. People talk. Have you ever had somebody come up to you in like the grocery store or something, just come up, start sharing their personal life with you? Just, you're like, who, 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 you know, that's what people do. People will talk. And particularly when they find out that you're in real estate, you know, one thing that people love to talk about real estate. And when they find out you're in real estate, oh my goodness, you're just open and the floodwaters are going to go and go and go. We can never catch everybody before we hit first substantial contact, but we always need to be on alert. Whenever we're acting in the capacity of a real estate agent, we always need to be on alert. Let's go back to my open house on Sunday. I'm doing an open house on Sunday. I have an interested buyer comes in and they walk in the front door and I say, hey guys, welcome to my open house. And they say, hey, thanks for having us. And we talk about the lovely weather. Maybe we talk about Super Bowl coming up. Have I learned anything about these guys? Particularly anything about their price, term, or motive, PTM. Have I learned anything about them? All right, I learned they like the sun, and I learned that they may watch the Super Bowl in a few weeks. What does that tell me about them buying or selling real estate? Nothing. So they come and go, they tour the home, and they leave. The whole thing happened, and we never hit first substantial contact. Now the next buyer group comes in. Hey guys, how are you doing today? Good weather, we're having Super Bowl two weeks away. And they say, yeah, gosh, we really, we're in a bind and we just, we gotta buy something pretty quickly. I need to get in before the next school season starts so I can get my kid into this school and da da da. Boom, did we just hit something substantial? I've learned their motive, I've learned their terms, I've learned their reasoning for buying. And guys, this is what I'm saying. We always need to be on alert because people, talk it blows my mind what they say again the idea in the perfect world is that we're going to give them the disclosure and review it with them handing it to them is not enough we're going to give them the disclosure we're going to review it with them ideally before we hit first substantial contact but there may be cases where we have, i'm i'm so sorry i hate to interrupt you but I need you to know that I represent the seller. And what you share with me is just as good as discussing directly with the seller. Put yourself in the consumer's shoes. Is it better for me to interrupt you and warn you or to let you keep talking, share your life story, tell me everything substantial about you that you know, say, okay, well, I got to take that to my seller because that's who I represent in the transaction. How is that protecting the consumer? What protects the consumer is stopping them. What protects the consumer is letting them know as early as I can when that first opportunity arises that who I represent and whose team I'm on. Exactly. Somebody said in the, in the, in the uh, chat, most people aren't negotiators. They don't understand how it can be used against them. 
Once again, that's not their job. That's my job. And that's why I have a duty to stop. them. I don't know what kind of, um, and I'll address that in a second too. I don't know what kind of house you were raised in, but the house I was raised in, I was raised that it's rude to interrupt people. It's rude to interrupt people when they're talking. Anybody else? Anybody else with me? In this case, it's rude to let them keep talking. It's rude not to interrupt them. In this case, y'all, mama was wrong. Y'all don't tell my mama I said that because I will never. But in this case, mama was wrong. It's rude to let them keep talking. Again, what are you going to say at the end? Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me. I will definitely pass that along to the seller and they will take that into consideration when they're, when they're looking at your offer. How does your buyer feel, that buyer feel right now? Don't they just feel like they've been bowled over? I feel like I know none of us know from personal experience, but I feel like we've all watched enough TV shows and movies throughout the time that we know what the Miranda rights are. And in part, what do the Miranda rights say? Anything you say can be held against you. In some aspects, we're Mirandarizing the consumer. We're letting them know, ah, 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 this is the side that I'm on. Please be careful what you say to me. Somebody else said, once we do our disclosure, they'll probably keep babbling on. Truth, truth, because they don't understand. But guys, once I've properly done my job and if I explained disclosure and I put the content in their hands and they've signed acknowledge and receipt, if they insist on keep talking, then I break out my notepad and my pen because back to my open house example, isn't my loyalty to the seller? And if this buyer brings an offer, I owe it to my seller to share everything. So once I do my disclosure and I properly do it and I properly explain it to them, I've done my job. And if they insist on talking, keep talking, take good notes. There was a story. <laughs> I love this story. There was a story that came out of uh, the Real Estate Commission a couple years ago. And one of our commissioners was he and his wife were legitimately wanting to buy a house. So they took a Sunday and they were open housing, seriously wanted to buy a house. And they were out. He wasn't out secret shopping or anything. Right. And he and his wife were out um, open housing. And in one of the open houses they went to, they were having conversation with the agent and the commissioner <laughs> felt like they had passed this first substantial contact. And the commissioner said, do you have anything that you need to go over with me? And the agent said, nope. And the commissioner said, there's nothing you need to disclose. And the agent said, huh? And the commissioner said, you're sure there's nothing that you need to discuss with me about your relationship with the seller. And the agent said, nope, all good, tip top. Then he said who he was. I'm a commissioner with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. What do you think that agent, do you think her, her gut, like, I mean, seriously, uttered a bunch of four letter words, right? It was probably at that moment that she was like, oh, something with working real estate agent disclosure. I share that story with you guys because first off, listen to when people are trying to tell you something, right? But second off, agents across the state do not do this properly. Agents across the state don't handle the disclosure rate. And this is one of these things, I've seen it in the disciplinary action time and time again. It's not a problem until it's a problem. And then it becomes a problem. Usually what happens is letter of inquiry comes in, they wanna investigate. They're kind of like the IRS. Once you let them in to look at one books, then they have book, then they have the option to look at all the books, right? So they may come in and investigate and they may say, you know what, while you're at it, why don't you send me all of your disclosures? Guys, here's the deal. Not uh, remember, this is a consumer form. Not all disclosures are going to turn into a customer or client. Some of these consumers may leave your open house and you never ever see them again. And one thing that the commission wants to know is that you have basically more disclosures than you do signed agency agreements. If you have a hundred percent return, 
if you get every single consumer you meet to sign an agency, the commission's probably going to want to talk to you because you know something that the rest of us don't. So if you're doing it right, you have disclosures for people. They're never going to come customers or clients. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I have a, my firm uses a program called Dot Loop, and I have a folder right now. It's called Working with Real Estate Agents 2023. I'm ready to dump my disclosures in because we document everything and we keep everything. Somebody says, you've always been asked by the broker, when, how, why, when you enter an open house. So you walk in an open house and they say, hey, this is what I want to buy and this is what I'm looking for and this is when I want to buy that. Again, you guys, agents across the state, I'm, I'm being very honest with you guys right now. Agents across the state do not do this right. They don't handle this right. I don't know why. I think it's uncomfortable for us. I think that's what it boils down to. But remember, it's not about me, is it? It's about the consumer and it's about the real estate commission protecting the consumer from me. So I think we kind of need to get over ourselves is that, if that's the case and make this part of your little elevator speech. You know, the first couple of times you do this, it's going to be bumpy and it's going to be awkward. And you're going to say, what did I just say? But once you do it enough times and you get your groove, it'll fall out. Um, so this idea of first substantial contact. Again, we have a duty to disclose agency status before the conversation moves from the property to the consumer. Always keep that price term and motive. Once I start asking the consumer about their price term or motive, or once the consumer stops, starts volunteering that. And that's where we need to be on alert because if we just said, people talk. It's never too early to do it. You may not wanna do it as soon as they walk into your open house. That's a good way to send them, turn them around and have them run away. So you may want to wait. Like I said, people come in and out of your open houses all the time. And we have not hit that first substantial contact. We don't need to do it. But we need to be on alert. So we disclose our status. We're interrupting them if need be, because that's what's best for them is to understand where I am, who I represent, where my loyalty is. So the examples we've been given so far, first substantial contact happens in person. You came into my open house. Uh, maybe I'm going to your house for a listing appointment. Maybe we're meeting at the office on Friday for a buyer consultation, right? I know we're gonna hit, if I come in for a buyer consultation, I know I'm starting gonna ask you a lot of questions. I know before I ask you those questions, I need to do that first substantial contact. But we always need to be on alert if first substantial contact can happen by phone, email. Maybe they uh, fill out your contact me page on your website. I had a listing a couple years ago and um, my, we have a team phone number and we all used to take turns answering the phone. So one of my teammates got a call that day and the call was coming in on one of my listings. So she answered the phone, you know, hi, thank you for calling. How may I help you today? And the woman on the other end of the phone said, I'm calling about 123 Main Street and I'm pre-approved for X amount. Boom. Did we just hit first substantial contact? I didn't know my girl's name yet. But didn't we hit first substantial contact? Y'all, this is people. This is what people do. Same thing with an email. They could send you a long, drawn out, two and a half page email that goes over everything they're looking for in a house, how much they're willing to pay, what they want to spend. Here's my life story, all in an email. Did we just hit first substantial contact as soon as you hit open? Yeah, as soon as you saw that email. If first substantial contact happens other than in person, still stop and discuss, right? On the phone, my teammate said, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, I appreciate you sharing this with us, but if you were to make an offer, 
we need to share that with our seller. That's where our duty is. And she explained it a little bit better than that, of course, but she explained it. And you know what that lady on the other end of the phone said? She said, y'all are the third real estate company I've called. And nobody, nobody has explained this to me. Now, listen, I get what she was doing. She was letting us know off the bat that she was an interested, serious buyer. And I get what she was doing. That's why she has a right to know how she could have harmed herself because she was so willing to drop and volunteer that information. Now, she never came forward and brought an offer, but if she did and it was anything under asking price, I'd have to tell my seller, I know for a fact that she's pre-approved for this amount. Maybe she's willing to spend that. Maybe she's not. I don't know, but I know how much she's pre-approved for because she just blurted it out on the phone as soon as we answered. We've always got to be on alert. Always. When you join your firms, they may encourage you to wear your name badge everywhere you go. Why? So people come up to you and start talking real estate. Again, people love to talk about real estate. So if you swing by the grocery store on your way home and you're wearing your name badge, Aren't you doing it to invite people to walk up to you in the grocery store and have a conversation about real estate? Maybe it turns into something, maybe it doesn't. It's all got to start somewhere, doesn't it? And you could be standing in aisle four in the grocery store, and if you allow it, first substantial contact could happen. Now, I don't have these things in my back pocket. I do keep them in my trunk, right? So they're not too far away. But that's why I say we need to be on alert. If you're phone or electronic means, or you don't have it physically on you, like in the grocery store, we still discuss it. We still have a conversation about it. But now I need to get your contact, try to get your contact information because I got three days to actually send you the disclosure. So let me ask you guys a question. Shake your head, yes or no. Can I make anybody do anything? I want somebody to say yes once because I want to figure out how. No, we typically can't make anybody do anything, right? So we go through our spiel and we hand them the disclosure and we say, sign here acknowledging receipt. And as the question just now came into the chat, what if they refuse to sign? <laughs> Can I make them sign? Can I put the pen in their hand and say, you will sign this? No, if they refuse to sign, I write that on the disclosure. Refuse to sign January, whatever the date is, January 24th. I show that I tried. I'm still having the conversation. I'm still having the discussion. I just can't put the pen in their hand and make them sign. If you know their name, you can say, Jessica refused to sign. You may not know their name. Not, no, anybody may wanna volunteer their name in the middle of the grocery store or even at your open house. So it comes in, what if we hit first substantial contact? We know something about the consumer now, but we discuss the disclosure and they want us to keep that info confidential. Do you still have to tell the other party we represent? And the answer to that question is yes, because we represent the other party. The other party has already hired me. This is why we need to stop them talking again. It's way more rude to let them talk than it is to interrupt them. And I think that kind of goes against our grain a little bit. because It sounds like we were all raised right. Don't interrupt people when they're talking. Sounds great. But in this case, we may have to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I need you to understand. I need you to be careful what you tell me. They don't know that. It's my job to explain it to them. So we have our disclosure. We either have it signed or we have refused to sign. Who can remind me? I think this came up last week. Let's see. Who can remind me how many years I have to keep records? How many years do I have? And you can show me. We keep, it looks like we did talk. I'm coming in the chat, look at you guys go. How many years do we have to keep records? We keep everything, including that signed disclosure or that refused to sign disclosure for three years. Again, I got a whole file 
labeled working with real estate agent disclosure 2023. Some of those may turn into a customer or client. Some of them may not. But we keep everything. We retain all records for three years. Fifty-eight A dot oh one oh eight is this rule. This is just here for reference. It's not one I've asked you guys to read, but it's the rule on retention of records. Keep everything for three years, at least three years. Three being the minimum. The real estate commission goes on to say, once we do our disclosure, once we do our part, at that point we need to determine in what capacity we're going to work. We need to know how to proceed. Are we gonna proceed with you being my client and getting old car in first class? Or are we gonna proceed with you being my customer and getting honesty, fairness, and the disclosure of material facts back in coach? When we come back from break, we're gonna look at the disclosure. Uh, we're gonna look at the information. I think that's absolutely helpful. Guys, we don't go over many forms in pre-licensing. We save a lot of the forms for post-licensing. We save some of them for once you get licensed and you're out there in the field. So if we're going over a form in pre-licensing, what should that mean to you? It's kind of important, isn't it? Yeah, we don't go over many. So let's go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to work with, look at our working with real estate agent disclosure.
Can you guys hear my alarm tonight? Did you hear it? Did I startle some of you? Sorry, I fixed it though. Isn't that good? So if you're unloading the dishwasher and you hear that, you know you need to come and run it. <laughs> All right, so we're back. Cameras are on and I can see you. And I'm going to take attendance. And we're gonna go in, we're gonna take a break from the PowerPoint for a second. And we're gonna go into the online learning system. So on the online learning system, you guys also have this, what we're, I'm getting ready to show you. It's in your book, starting on page 167. So I got it for, and what is in the book is correct. It is good. <clears throat> so you got it here in the online learning system. You also got it in the book. And a couple things about our disclosure before we look at it. At first glance, it might appear to be a two page document, but it's not. I have a working with real estate aid disclosure for sellers. And then I have one. Here we go. For buyers. So it depends on who you're talking to, what consumer you're talking to. We're just going to look at one, but you guys have both. They're pretty much the same. Just depends on who you're talking to. So the first thing this says is this form is required for use in all sales transactions. It is for residential and commercial sales. Again, we don't need to do this for lease. I do know some property managers that have a disclosure form that are similar to this. If you're doing lease transactions, you can choose to do it. Thank you for, as you guys are coming back, thank you for telling me that you're here. You can choose to do it for lease, but the commission rule says that we only have to do it for sales transactions. And guys, always remember, your test is not gonna ask you what you're going to do. Your test is asking you what you can do. So the test, the commission rule <clears throat> says that this is only required for sales transactions. <clears throat> so this is our working with real estate agent disclosure for sellers. It starts with a big important. And <clears throat> the first thing it says is what? This form is not a contract. I do not use this to create agency. I'm not creating agency. I'm disclosing my status. To the consumer, signing this disclosure only means that you've received it. Then we got some bullet points. In a real estate transaction, it's important that you understand whether an agent represents you. It doesn't really specify what agent, does it? Me, you, somebody else with a license? It just says it's important that the consumer knows whether an agent, any agent, represents you. <clears throat> real estate agents are required to first review this form with you at first substantial contact. And then it goes on to say, for substantial contact before asking for or receiving your confidential information. And two, give you a copy of the form after you sign it. This form is for your own protection, consumer. This form is for your protection. And then this third bullet point is pretty powerful. Do not share any confidential information with our agent any agent or assume that the agent is acting on your behalf until you have entered into a written agency agreement with the agent to represent you. Otherwise, the agent can share your confidential information with others. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Careful what you tell me. I can, not only can, I'm obligated to share your confidential information with those that I represent. Then the form, it has a note to agent, note to us. We need to make this just a little smaller so we can see everything. Um, we're told to check all relationship types below that may apply. So then we have kind of a, a list, if you will. 
There's seller's agency where <clears throat> we're acting as a listing agent. There's a dual agent, a designated dual agent, and then a buyer agent working with an unrepresented seller. In this case, also known as the for sale by owner. The unrepresented seller is the for, is the for sale by owner. Here's the deal. The agent, let's think of these four options as a menu. The agent is telling the consumer what their firm provides. What menu items do we provide? The eight, or excuse me, the consumer is not saying, I want this, this, and this. It says, note to the agent, we check all relationship items below the plot. Just because you check something doesn't mean that's how we're gonna proceed. Again, we're not creating agency. I'm inviting you to look at our menu options. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you look at a menu. I mean, I know this sounds like a lot of fun, but do you ever just say, give me one of everything? Wouldn't that be a lot of fun? Call me if you ever do that, right? I'll come meet you. But we don't, that's not how we look at a menu. That's not how we do that, right? We look at what they have available. We look at what they have to offer us and then we decide. We're not asking them to decide just yet. We're just providing our menu. Remember we said not all firms offer designated dual agency. So if you're in a firm that doesn't, you're not gonna check this because it's not a service I can provide. It's not something that they can order off the menu. <clears throat> um, note to seller, for more information on agencies, duties and services, they're referring them to the Q&A on the working with real estate agent. We'll look at that next. The seller needs to sign it. Two places for two sellers and print their names. Please note, the agent is only putting their name. The agent doesn't have to sign this. This is no contract. The seller in this case is signing, acknowledging receipt. They're signing, acknowledging that I've given the information and I put this in their hands. The agent needs to put their name. You need to put your license number. Once you get, once you get your license, you'll get a six digit number. Go ahead and memorize that because you need it pretty much everywhere you go. I think a general rule of thumb is when you're signing something as an agent, it needs to be accompanied by your license number. So just go ahead, make an index card if you have to, but just go ahead and memorize that six digit number because you'll need it. And then we go through the similar exercise with buyers. Again, the same importance. Now our menu items change slightly. Now when we're working with the buyer consumer, maybe we offer them buyer agency, dual agent, designated dual agent, or the service of working with an unrepresented buyer as a seller subagent. Again, I'm not saying this is how we're gonna to work together. I'm saying these are your choices. This is what I have to offer you. Buyer signs, agent puts their names. So I think in your book, that's 167 and 168, one for the seller and one for the buyer. Does that look right? Okay. Then in your book on page 169, and also in the online learning system, we have a Q&A brochure on working with real estate agents. I think you guys should read this. It's my opportunity to explain agency to the consumer. How many of you have gotten your family to help you study? We have our family support. We have our family studying. Is your family learning just as much as real estate school as you are? Yeah, it, yeah, right. Thank your family, you guys. But guys, it's so important that we, um, we start this family support now because, you know, like we mentioned before class started, real estate is not a Monday through Friday nine to five job. And we need to get our families on board. There may be some nights that you're not home for dinner. There may be some Sundays that you're doing an open house or some Saturday morning that you're out showing property, right? I mean, let's just face it. So it's important that we have our family support and we have our family on board early on. And one way we can get our family involved now is to have them help us study. And I think if you can explain agency, if you can go over the disclosure, and you can discuss what's in the Q&A brochure. Do not read it to them. But you can discuss it with them. And they understand it. Then you're having a good understanding of agency. 
if you go through this brochure and you disclose agency and your family member looks at you and goes, huh? Go back and review it again. You guys with me? Having them support, having them help you. Remember our stars on our PowerPoints? We've seen a lot of red stars in unit seven, haven't we? Red star says, I need to be able to explain it to somebody else in a way that they understand. And this is how you can get your family on board with helping you today with your brand new career. So use these as tools to help you start formulating these conversations that you're gonna have with soon to be consumers. So Q&A, again, we're not gonna read it to them, but one thing I do wanna point out that I like about this Q&A brochure, it starts with just defining agency. What does the word agency mean? What is an agency agreement? Is there a standard length of time? The answer is no, we're gonna talk about that in unit eight. Is there a standard fee? The answer is no, we're gonna talk about that in unit eight. But then the brochure kind of breaks it down, Q&A specifically to sellers. So if the consumer that you're talking to is a consumer that might be selling, this is a section just for them. We can actually put this in their hands and say, look, look, this is about you. This is Q&A for you, seller. As you can imagine, if we scroll down a little bit, I got a Q&A just for buyers. So who, again, who is this consumer? Are they thinking about selling? Are they thinking about buying? This brochure breaks it down. And then the last little section talks about um, termination, termination of agency agreements and how that can end. So again, these brochures, and this should be what, 169 through 172 or 173 in your book, something like that. And I got it on the online learning systems. But use these as tools. You guys use these as tools to help you better understand this stuff. And then once you get your license, use this as a tool to help the consumer understand it. Uh, remember, you know, we didn't walk away last week from an a as an agency expert. And neither are your buyers or sellers the first time you explain it to them. It's not their job to understand agency. It's your job to understand it and explain it to them. And if you can't explain it to your family members, how are you gonna explain it to a member of the public? Does this make sense? So use your family, offer to take them out for a nice dinner, maybe grab them a six pack and a Pepsi when you get your license, whatever they, you know, a six pack and a pizza I meant, because I'm a thirsty girl, six pack and Pepsi. A six pack and a pizza, whatever it is that they want, <laughs> but they can help you starting today. What questions do I have about the disclosure? Working with real estate agent disclosure. Thank you. We, I say the Q&A brochure that the commission provides, there is actually a nice glossy brochure that you can purchase. They do also provide the flat PDF that's free. I'm kind of frugal. I like the flat PDF. What we just looked at in the online learning system is the flat PDF. But if you were to purchase a brochure, one thing you would get in the brochure that we didn't see in the flat PDF is pictures. They gave us pictures, we like pictures. And they kind of give us pictures to help illustrate the different, to our consumers, the different type of agency relationships. So the first option we have, buyer agency and seller agency. You see how the brokers are two different colors? I got a red broker and a blue broker. That's indicating that there were two different firms. So in this case, the red broker is holding hands with the buyers, the blue broker is holding hands with the seller. We're not connected, we're not in firms. Then we may have a dual agency situation. Brokers are the same color, right? I got two red brokers and they're holding hands. So not only are they holding the hand of their buyer and the seller, but these guys are still holding hands because they're in dual agency. 
Or you could have dual agency where it's just one broker holding both hands of the buyer and the seller. And then look at what happens in designated. Aren't they the same color? Aren't they both still with the red firm? But now they're not holding hands anymore, are they? They're still holding the hand of their buyer. They're still holding the hand of the seller, but the agents are no longer, even when they're with the same firm. And I think the picture, and that's why I provide them here to you guys on the uh, PowerPoint slide, because the brochure provides us these pictures. So when we're talking to the consumer, we can, uh, we can show them pictures to better help understand these different relationships. Again, that's one disadvantage of the flat PDF that you have in the online learning system is you don't have the pictures. I like pictures. So with dual agency, where there's two brokers? This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm trying to figure. Um, does they do they have like who are their loyalty with? Like, both do they them. know if both of them? Both of them. They both get my loyalty. They both get my equal. Remember, the only thing that goes away, and somebody else said the same thing. They thought it was misleading because we're no longer providing full service. You're right because remember, in dual agency, I'm no longer an advocate. My advocacy goes away. I'm still there guiding you guys through the transaction, but I can't give advice. I may be, not be able to console one party over the other. Is it misleading? I don't know about all that because I am still holding their hands. They are still in first class. I'm still guiding them through the transaction, but I just have a few, just a few things. They still get all of old car. They're just not going to get advocacy. They're not going to get my advice anymore. Even, even with, but they have two brokers. Is, okay, so let me how ask many this. Firms, how many firms? What's the difference? What's the difference between that dual agency and designated dual agency? Because I'm getting confused because there's two. Brokers. One agent has been kicked off the wall to work exclusively with the buyer, and a different agent has been kicked off the wall to work exclusively with the seller. Okay. Well, okay. The firm's still holding hands, right? The firm is still there. But as far as the individual agent goes, we drop hands. We have a wall between us now. We separate. Okay. So what's the purpose of the second broker being there? Oh, okay, I get it. I'll make okay, now it's making sense because it's just the firm. So it don't matter how many people, if it's just no, I do. I'm gonna ask. What <laughs> Because there's two agents right there, but it's dual agent instead of designated. I understand designated is when they exclusively mm -hmm. work with the mm -hmm. the agent, but in that one, there's two. Mm -hmm. But so there's dual agency can be, be dual agency uh -huh. can be one broker working with both buyer and seller. Dual agency can be two, one working with the buyer, the other one working with the seller, and that's what uh -huh. we're representing here in the two different dual agencies. This is just one broker working with both. This is two agents, one working with the buyer, one working with the seller. Okay, so they can, okay, that makes sense for this. I have a question. I'm, oh, I'm confused okay. still, I'm sorry. Spend some time with it, you guys. Yep, specific questions. Michaela, was that you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's really, I mean, I guess it seems like there's really minimal difference between the dual agencies, like the two different dual agencies, because it's really the exact same thing, except they're just bringing another person into the mix. It's a difference it's, in one broker or two. Yep. But it's still basically the same. It's still how many firms? One. Just one. Always one. So what remember, would be the Please point? remember, the relationship is not between the client and the individual agent. It's between the client and who? I'm getting in the chat. Who's the relationship with the client and? The firm. The firm. The firm represents the buyer. The firm represents the seller. In dual agency, the firm 
represents both one firm, one transaction, two clients. So my, my interpretation, the difference between dual and designated that you're asking is the fact that when we're designated, we don't know the information about the other party. Whereas the individual, dual, the individual, right? Because you can't be designated if you've received prior confidential information about the other side. You cannot be designated if you know something about the other side going into it. You can't see the group chat, probably because everybody's just sending me a direct message. So there's not for you guys to see, which is fine. And I try to read them out loud as they come in because I know you can't. I do that for a reason. I'm all about minimizing distractions. And if y'all can chat with each other in class, I would consider that a distraction. Does that mean? I don't know. That's a conversation for another day. I'm all about minimizing distractions. Y'all turn the TV off. <laughs> You guys have got to spend some time with it. Look, remember, we looked at a bunch of pictures last week. Um, I got another a few more resources for you guys in just a second. I'm not done giving you resources to help you understand this material. But you guys have got to keep at it until it clicks. Because I promise you, once it starts clicking, it's going to be like click, 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 click. Anybody had a few clicks yet over the weekend when you study? A few clicks? Good. Keep at it. Go for more clicks. As it hasn't clicked yet, Go back to the book, go back to the Q&A brochure, go back and watch YouTube again. And again, I got a few more resources for you guys in just a second to help it click. So under this conversation with disclosure, we need to get into some specifics. Um, all of this is from Commission Rule, .A, or Commission Rule A.0104. If you haven't started reading this yet, please do. Please, anybody started it yet? Few of you. If you can't do it all in one sitting, break it up. It's tough. I get it. Read it once, read it twice, read it the third time. That's when things start clicking. So let's talk about specifics. Pretty much what we've been talking about so far is I'm going to disclose my status when I am meeting a prospective buyer or seller for the first time. Remember, first substantial contact with prospective buyers or sellers, prospective consumers in a sales transaction. If you've already been hired as a seller's agent or you are working as a sub-agent and you're communicating with a buyer or a buyer's agent, commission rule says I disclose my status of being a seller's agent at first substantial contact. This is the example that we gave of a buyer consumer coming into my open house. I've already been hired by the seller's agent. I'm already employed by the seller's agent. Buyer comes into my open house. I have a duty to disclose my status at first substantial contact. Obviously we're not gonna do the disclosure when we're communicating with other agents, but we still have to disclose who we are. Now let's look at this third one. If you've already been hired as a buyer's agent, a buyer has already hired you, and you're communicating with a seller or a seller's agent on behalf of your buyer, I have a duty to disclose my status at initial contact. So let's talk about the difference between first substantial contact and initial contact. Initial contact is pretty much, hi, my name is Julie, and I'm working with a buyer that's interested in your listing. We didn't have to worry about hitting anything for substantial. The only thing you knew about me was my name. So let's walk through a few scenarios. I have been hired as a buyer's agent. There's a new listing that hits the market. My buyer calls me and they say they're interested. They want to see it tomorrow morning. Great. And my buyer says, before I see this tomorrow morning though, I have a couple questions. Can you find out for me? I say, of course. I, on behalf of my buyer, contact the, the listing agent or the seller, if it's a for sale by owner, I'm gonna go directly to the seller. 
And I call these people and I say, hi, my name is Julie Campbell and I'm working with a buyer that's interested in your listing on 123 Main Street. When did I disclose my status of who I am in this transaction? When did I disclose my role? I mean, right after my name, right? I told you my name and I stated my purpose. That's what we mean by initial contact. Now let's say you're working as a buyer's agent. They want to see a listing and they don't have any questions. They just want you to schedule the showing. Most of us here across the state use it's a centralized showing system, centralized showing service, where we just go to one place to schedule all of our showings. So in other words, I don't have to call every single firm. We just go to one place. It's a one and done. It's really nice. When you go to the centralized showing system to schedule your appointment, you have to check a box that tells why are you scheduling this appointment? Are you scheduling it as a buyer's agent? Are you scheduling it as a seller sub agent? You have to identify your role when you're scheduling the appointment. You schedule the appointment, you hit submit. The seller and the seller's agent will get an email or a text, however they set it up. And that email or text is gonna say, Julie Campbell, comma, buyer's agent, comma, wants to show your property at 10 a.m. Again, when did I disclose my status that I'm working with a buyer's agent? When did I disclose? that it wasn't when we hit first substantial contact it was initial it was up front I got that out of the way as soon as I gave you my name and that's what we mean by the difference of initial contact and first substantial contact we're gonna um <laughs> we get to see all this again we talked about the comments the license law and commission rule comments last week I hope you have started to look through that. When you do look through that, you're gonna see it talks about our agency agreements. It talks about agency disclosure. It's another thing that talks about this stuff twice. Again, what does that mean to you if we mention it twice? <laughs> kind of important. So we're gonna see it again. You guys will read about it in the comments. We'll talk about it again. The more you can expose yourself to it, the better it's gonna click. One more thing about agency disclosures is dealing with auction sales. Yes, auction sales is a sales, but auction sales, when you guys think about auction sales, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to put auctions in a completely different category, put them in a completely different bucket because they're not handled the way traditional or typical sales transactions are handled. They're totally different. And this is what I need you guys to hear. Don't even worry about auction sales unless you are specifically asked about auction sales. If the question doesn't specifically mention auction sales, pretend that they don't even exist. So we're gonna put them in their own little category all by themselves. They are totally different beats. Anybody ever been to a real estate auction? Few of you? No, we should go. I, I, th I think big field trip, right? Class trip, let's go. I think it would be interesting. Um, I hope I'm not hyping it up. But I think it would be interesting. But anyway, what we need to know about auction sales is that we don't worry about them unless we're specifically asked about them. And if you are asked about disclosure and auction sales, it is not required. For some reason, it's okay for these buyers to assume that the auctioneer represents the seller. I don't know why, but here we are. So everybody with me, can I get some thumbs up? Auctions don't even exist unless you're specifically asked about auctions. So we have our agency disclosure and then we have our agency agreements. Disclosure is not creating an agency relationship. Disclosure is just me 
stating my status. And more importantly, me telling the consumer, ah, 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 careful what you tell me, because what you share with me, I have a duty to take back to my client. Another piece in unit seven, and we've kind of, we've danced around this a little bit. But now let's talk about oral buyer agency. The real estate commission will allow us to work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first. And everybody please understand, I cannot perform a single service for an owner without having a written agreement. There is no such thing as oral seller agency, okay? The only oral relationship we're allowed to have at first is with buyers. Oral agency, oral buyer agency is an agency agreement. It is buyer agency, does everybody see that? It is agency, we are creating agency, but we're not doing it in writing just yet. Why don't you guys tell me in a private chat, and I'll leave that you have plenty of room to write down everything. Please tell me in a private chat, in a buyer agency agreement, specifically in an oral buyer agency agreement, what do I owe the buyer? Two words, in an agency agreement, specifically an oral buyer agency agreement, what do I owe the buyer? I'm liking it. In an oral buyer agency agreement, in any agency agreement, what do I owe, in this case, that buyer? Oral buyer agency is buyer agency. And what I owe this buyer is old car. They get old car from me. It is an agency agreement. We just haven't put it in writing yet. So what do we need to know about oral buyer agency? Do you think we're just gonna proceed? Do you think I'm just gonna start acting like their agent without having a conversation or anything about that? We talked about that last week. It's called implied agency and implied agency is never allowed. So our oral buyer agency agreements are express. What do we know about an express agreement? The terms have been clearly stated. Maybe it's in writing, maybe it's face-to-face, -face, maybe it's orally, but in an express agreement, express agreement, the terms have been clearly stated. Again, you guys, I can't just start acting like a buyer without first explaining or acting like a buyer's agent without first explaining that relationship. It is buyer agency. The real estate commission says that we can work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first, up until the time that we're ready to present an offer on the buyer's behalf. The latest opportunity I have to get this thing in writing and get it signed is when I'm ready to present an offer on my buyer's behalf. What do you think? All right, so we've already decided an oral buyer agency agreement. I owe that buyer old car, right? They've hired me. They've just done it orally. We haven't had me put in anything yet. So I owe them old car. What do you think they owe me in an oral agreement? What do they owe me?
maybe if they're nice. And an oral agreement, there it is. And an oral agreement, they owe me nothing. And that includes compensation. The reason we got to put these things in writing before we're ready to present an offer is to solidify that relationship in writing, but to ensure that we get paid. Y'all want to get paid at the end of the transaction? Yeah. The only way we can ensure that you get paid is if we have a written agency agreement. So here's the deal. Why is this even allowed? The Real Estate Commission recognizes that some buyers are cautious, some buyers are timid. The Real Estate Commission recognizes that sometimes it takes us longer to form relationships, to build trust with buyers. And so because of that, I mean, buyers are like these scared, skittish little creatures that will run away if there's any sound made in the woods, right? <sighs> So in order to help us work with them and build that trust and build that relationship, the commission will allow us to work with a buyer at first under an oral buyer agency agreement. This is another one of these things that I say, y'all do not get in your own way. Some of you may be sitting there thinking right now, uh, -uh if that buyer doesn't sign, I'm not working with them. Some of you may join a firm that says, if the buyer doesn't sign, we're not working with them. Once again, the test is not going to ask you what you're going to do. The test is going to ask you what you can do. Can you work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first? Can you? Yes. And that's what your test is going to ask you. Y'all get out of your own ways please. So you've been with a buyer under an oral agreement. Maybe you've been out for, you know, three months, six months, whatever, until they find the one. I always get asked, how long do you work with a buyer? Until they find the one. It's more than just showing them three properties and saying, okay, pick one. Okay. So you've been out with a buyer for a couple months. You've been looking at properties. All of a sudden you walk in, in, the, in a home and they go, this is it. This is the one we've been looking for. You think, oh, thank God. Great. Let's write it up. So the first thing you need to do is help them write up the offer. Help them fill in the blanks. Help them, you know, how much do you want to offer? When do you want to close? Uh, do you want a seller pay closing costs, right? Like help them fill in the details. We're going to look at our contract in unit 10. I can help them write the offer. I have them fill in the blanks. We, we fill the blanks in together. I send it to them to sign. But before I can present it, before I can call the listing agent or the seller and say, I am bringing you an offer or I am sending you an offer. That's what I mean by presenting it. Before I take it to the other side, we've got to get our buyer agency agreement signed. Few caveats with oral buyer agency. Oral buyer agency is a non-exclusive relationship. I cannot demand exclusivity. Remember, in an exclusive relationship, how many firms is the buyer dating? If it's exclusive, how many firms is the buyer dating? The buyer's dating just one. If it's non-exclusive, how many firms can the buyer date? They're out there playing the field now, aren't they? They're talking to all the firms. They got everybody working. That's what we mean. I cannot demand exclusivity. I cannot look at that buyer under an oral agreement and say, you're going to work with me and only me. If I demand exclusivity, we got to put it in writing. The other caveat in an oral buyer agency agreement, I cannot... Um, limit us for a, spe a specified period of time. So in an oral agreement, I cannot look at that buyer and say, all right, we're going to work together for two weeks or two months or six months or whatever. If I want to put a time frame on it, I got to get it in writing. So again, there's a few caveats. It's not exclusive. I have heard of buyers 
calling three or four different real estate firms and saying, this is what I'm looking for. The first one to find it wins. Go. They can do that as long as we stay non-exclusive. Who are they going to sign the agency agreement with? The one that finds them what they're looking for. Do you have to engage in that? Of course not. But that's the idea. That is the idea behind it. It's not exclusive. And it cannot be for a per uh, certain period of time. And I think what tends to trip us up is that it's express. Again, express meaning that the terms have been clearly stated. So let's say you create this oral buyer express agreement and you do it face-to-face. -face. Maybe they come in for the buyer consultation and you create this oral buyer agency face-to-face. -face. Do you think you should go home and follow up this conversation with an email? Do you think you should go home and put, look at all y'all shaking your heads. Yes, thank you. That does my heart good. Because what do we document? Everything. I'm not asking them to sign anything just yet. But I still need to make sure they understand the terms. I still need to make sure they understand my duties and responsibilities and what theirs will be when we do put it in writing. Does that make sense? So please make sure you document this conversation. If it doesn't already happen in the email, go home and pound out an email talking about, it was nice meeting you today per our conversation. This is what we formed. It's called Oral Buyer Agency. This is our duty, da 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 da, -da. spell them all out. I got a sample letter I'll show you guys in just a second. So let me address the what ifs. I hear you guys. What if, Julie? What about, what if, what if, what if? What if you're ready to present an offer on your buyer, your oral buyer agreement behalf, but that buyer refuses to sign the agency agreement? You've been with them for nine months. They finally find the one. You write it up and you say, I'm getting represent the offer. And they say, yeah, no, I'm not going to sign that. Once again, can I make anybody do anything? Can I put the pen in their hand and say, you will? Something, unfortunately not. I'm still trying to figure that out. So here's our options. First option, number one, you guys, when we meet our agency agreement, our buyer agency agreement later this week, we're going to see that I have a place where I could create agency just for one property. So if they're hesitant to sign, I can get them to enter an agency agreement just for that one property that I'm getting ready to present the offer on. We can be in an agreement just for 123 Main Street. Okay, so that's an option. Throw that out there. If it works out and you buy it, I'll be your agent throughout the transaction. If we don't, if it doesn't work out and you don't get to buy it, then hopefully I can continue building your trust. Hopefully we can get back out and I can continue forming that relationship. But what if? What if the buyer says no? No, 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 no. I'm not going to sign anything. Well, I can't represent that buyer as a buyer client. If they won't enter into a written agreement and commit with me, I can't be there. I cannot present an offer on their behalf without having that relationship solidified in writing. So I cannot offer, um, represent that buyer as a client anymore. Again, I can try to get them into just one address. The other option I have is the commission doesn't like us. They uh, frown upon it. But you may want to consider offering to downgrade this buyer, downgrade them from a client to a customer. Have you ever been, have you ever flown and you've been downgraded from first class to coach? Boy, the airlines would make the headlines if they started doing that, right? I know you paid for a first class ticket, but we're going to let you ride in coach, okay? Right? Do we like being downgraded? No. The reason this is frowned upon, if this happens first off, the buyer gets downgraded. They were my client and now they're my customer. And before they do that, they need to now understand now that I'm a seller sub agent, everything I knew about them, who do I take to now? Now I got to take it to the seller, don't I? So I remind them, 
remember when you told me this and that? Remember when you told me how much you were willing to pay, how low you were willing to go? Remember, remember, remember? I got to remind them about what I know about them because now that very information could harm them in this transaction. The other piece of this, remember, we have to have the firm and the seller's permission to do seller subagency. So even if the seller and the sub and the, the buyer agrees to this, we need to make sure that the seller, that's right, we have you, you and I are like right here today, aren't we? We have to make sure, <laughs> we have to make sure that the seller and the listing firm will allow it. Remember, not all listing firms allow it. So that's step one. And if they do, again, this is last ditch effort. I have such a hard time with the second bullet point because it is such a hard time. I don't know why the commission allows it, but what I do know is that they highly frown upon it. And if you're going to ask your buyer to make the switch, I need you to document the heck out of it. I mean, this isn't like document everything. This is like big time document right here. Because if and when it goes down, I need you guys having that entire conversation in writing that you warned the buyer about this, that you told them about the downgrade, that you said, I have to share your information with the seller. Try to get them to sign. And if they won't, and you're not comfortable with the second bullet point, I would. The commission isn't crazy about it. Sorry, I'm out. I have two options to work with you. Either you're my client or you're my customer. Those are my only legal alternatives. That's it. That's all I got. And if you don't want to be either one, I got nothing else to offer you. There are no other choices. In an oral buyer agency agreement, we may also get consent for or not for dual agency. We can get consent for dual agency orally in an oral buyer agency agreement. And if they change their mind, we can get them to change their mind orally. If consent or non-consent is, uh, is already in writing, basic contract law says, you can only change a written agreement in writing. So an oral buyer can orally agree or not agree and change their mind all orally, all before we put it in writing. But once we get that in writing, the only way we can change it is in writing. Basic contract law. We can always go back and revisit dual agency if the opportunity comes up. Questions on oral buyer agency. So before, say you're with your client and you say, well, can you say, I, you talk about the disclosure orally and then you say, I can only continue to work with you if you sign. Can Is you? Yeah. I yeah. mean, your firm's policy could say that's how we want you to work with our buyers. So can you require a buyer up front to sign a written agreement before you do anything? You can't, if that's what your firm's policy says, if your firm policy allows it. That's not what your test is gonna ask you. Your test is gonna ask you, does the commission allow you to work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first? Gotcha. I, I, I hear you, I, I hear you. It's, it's, I know, right? You're telling me you want me to work with this buyer for six months and I have no guarantee of getting paid. Yeah, uh -huh. that's what I'm telling you. How's that sound? Everybody good? Yeah, right. I hear exactly what you're saying. Again, you guys, buyers are just these, they tend to be more skittish. They tend to be more untrusting. 
I mean, real estate salespeople, I mean, we're salespeople and not all salespeople have the best reputation. You know, the pushy salesman. Yeah, that's us. That's where you're heading. And so some people go into this with their wall up already because they know they're getting ready to deal with these money hungry agents that just want to make a sale so they can get paid a commission. That's all we do, right? So they're hesitant coming into it. And because of that, the commission will allow us, and it's all about building that trust, building that rapport. Okay, the last little piece of unit seven, we're getting there. Talks about a couple of things in nature of the brokerage business. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about your broker in charge or the BIC. Uh, we'll talk more about them when we get to license law and commission rule. You guys will learn about the BIC before we get to it, because you'll read about them in the comments, how you become a BIC and all that good stuff. We'll talk about that. Let's understand right now that every office location has a designated broker in charge every location so once again these firms with multiple offices if your firm has five locations how many designated bics do you need you need five one under each roof and that designated bic is responsible for the day-to-day -day actions of the brokers um, if you have any unlicensed employees maybe your receptionist for example maybe an unlicensed employee they're responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of the firm. And one of the BIC's biggest responsibilities is soon to be you guys, the provisional broker. So let's talk about this briefly. We're gonna get into it more in license law and commission rule, but I know we have a lot of questions. Let's say you went to take your state exam today and you passed. Yay, we're all happy. We all passed and got our license today, right? Once you pass that state exam, they're going to email you a license. Once you pass, or not email it, no, no, they're going to mail it to you. And once you pass that state exam, your license is on inactive status. Congratulations, you passed the state exam. Here's your license that you cannot do anything with. Good job. As a provisional broker, to activate your license, you have to affiliate with a firm. You have to go under the direct supervision of a broker in charge. They're not going to hand you a license and let you run amok on the street. You guys need more training. You need more education. And that's where the bit comes in to hold your hand. So as a provisional broker, the only way to have an active license is if you affiliate with a firm. You are one of the BIC's biggest responsibilities. You are a big liability to your BIC. If a provisional broker gets themselves in trouble with the real estate commission, they will take their BIC down with them. If a non-provisional broker gets themselves in trouble, they may take their, book, their BIC down. It just depends. But as a PB, oh, you're taking your BIC. You're going to get yourself in disciplinary action, you're gonna get your bit in disciplinary action as well. I call you guys, my provisional brokers, I call y'all my brokers with training wheels. As a provisional broker, you cannot ride your bike by yourself just yet. You have to have that support as a broker in charge. Couple questions coming in. Can we still become a realtor as a provisional broker? And the answer is yes. As a provisional broker, you can do just about anything that a full broker can do, as long as you're under the direct supervision of a broker in charge. Another question in the chat, how long are you a provisional broker? You have your provisional status until you finish and complete your post-licensing courses. There are three post-licensing courses and you gotta complete all three of those and take a test at the end of each class to drop your provisional status. You have up to 18 months to do that. 
So the day you get your license starts your 18 month clock. And it's three 30 hour post licensing. Yes, there is a test at the end of each class. No, you don't have to go back to the testing center. It's just an in-class exam. And I'm here to tell you guys right now, post licensing is not near as intense as pre. This is the hard part right here. However, you still gotta pass the test. So I need you guys to participate in class, pay attention, do the homework assignments, right? Because you still gotta pass the test. Once you pass those three tests, you drop your provisional status and you're just a broker. Again, we're gonna talk more about this. I know there's a lot of questions. Um, we're getting there. I sound like a broken record and I don't mean to. This is me just saying somewhere between now and the class before test day, <laughs> we will get there. Still got a lot more to say. All right, we have to take a break first. So let's take a break and we come back, we're gonna, shoot, we are so close to wrapping up unit seven.
Are we back? The cameras are coming on. Let's see. Give me a few seconds. So I'm going to take attendance. Let's take So again, back to Green Star stuff, just introducing these things. Uh, we've talked about a little bit about the relationship between the BIC and the PB. Does it make your dogs jump? Sorry. <laughs> it gets your attention though, so that's what I need. <laughs> so we are talked a little bit about the relationship of the PB and the BIC, obviously talking more about that. The other thing about the brokerage business is understanding that most of you are going to come in as affiliates. You're gonna come in as independent contractors <laughs> versus an employee. You hire an employee. As an independent contractor, you affiliate with a firm. And most agents are going to be affiliated as an independent contractor. As an independent contractor, who is your boss? Who do you work for? You work for you. So if you want to start complaining about your boss, <laughs> be careful. You are your own boss. So one of the big difference between an employee and a independent contractor, the employee has their work hours dictated, their working conditions dictated. The employee is told you punch in every morning, Monday through Friday at nine o'clock. You go to lunch from 12 to one and you log out at five. The independent contractor doesn't have a time clock. The independent contractor pretty much work when we want to. So if I decide to take this week off, I, I'm not, I have to ask anybody to work for me, but I need to understand that if I don't do any work this week whatsoever, I'm not going to see that product. I'm not going to see that outcome. I think sometimes this is hardest for especially new agents. Y'all, your BIC maybe is a provisional broker, but once you drop that provisional status, your BIC isn't going to call you every day and say, what did you do today that was productive? What did you do today to find a buyer or seller client? That's on you to work today. That's what we mean as an independent contractor. Now they can help and they'll offer support and they'll be very, very supportive of you. But ultimately, whether you work today is on you, not them. The other big difference between the two is how we're paid. The employee gets salary or hourly, at the end of the year, they get a W-2. What that means is that an employee's taxes are withheld from each check. You guys ever been employees and you know when you get your check, it's not the amount you thought you were gonna get, it's the amount you thought you're gonna get minus all those taxes. With a 1099, you're paid on a commission basis. It closes, you get a commission. It closes, you get a commission. And we get a 1099. With a 1099, taxes are not withheld each commission check. They don't do withholdings, but never fear. At the end of the year, Uncle Sam is standing there with his hand out. At the end of the year, Uncle Sam will want his cut. Has anybody ever been or currently acting as an independent contractor? It's not just real estate. There's independent contractors everywhere, several of you. If you're new to the idea of an independent contractor, if you're new to real estate as being an independent contractor, especially your first year in sales, you may want to hire an accountant or a CPA because they can advise you on how much each check to set aside so you can be prepared to pay Uncle Sam at the end of the year. Don't let that sneak up on you, it will hurt. So no to set aside some each commission check. How much? I don't know. I'm not an accountant. That's where they can advise you. But another thing is an independent contractor that the account can advise you on are things that you can take as tax deductions. So, you know, just as some examples, mileage, advertising, right? You take a client out for a Starbucks. Can you turn that in? That kind of thing. So I really highly, strongly recommend that you guys 
as independent contractors, especially new to real estate, have an account at least your first year to make sure you're taking advantage of everything you can be and to make sure that your taxes are withheld properly. I think that gets a lot of first year agents. They're going, woohoo, I got this check and they didn't take taxes. And you think you pulled something over on the government? I'm not sure what you think. And then the end of the year comes and you file that return and guess what? They say, wow, you, we had a great year, pay up. And that's what you guys need to be ready for. They will get their share, do not worry. Questions on this, comments? All right, so what I have for you guys, I have a couple uh, situations. We're gonna finish this up, have a few more conversations, another way to expose yourself to it so we can help it click. So here's a situation. I want you guys to read it, think it through, and then we're gonna talk about it. So let's see what this says. First off, the listing agreement does not authorize dual agency. The seller has said no to dual. Very important. Do I have everybody so far? The seller has said no to dual agency. The consumer contacts the listing company to see the property. The broker reviews. They're working with real estate agent disclosure. They offer to show the properties a seller subagent cautioning the buyer that nothing the buyer reveals is confidential. The buyer should act as if they're talking directly to the seller. If the buyer agrees, the broker provides written notice to seller sub-agency and proceeds to show the property. What, if anything, did this broker do wrong? What are your thoughts on this? What, if anything at all, did this broker do wrong? Anybody want to venture a guess? You're free to unmute if you want. You want to direct chat or just say it? You want to just say it. You unmuted first. Go for it. What you got, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, <clears throat> the agent did not get permission from the seller or the or the or the firm, right, to engage in sub agency. They already have authorization. Not do not have authorization. So what the seller is saying is you can't bring a buyer client. Can the firm bring a buyer customer? Shake your head, yes or no. Seller said no, client's not going to happen. Can the firm bring a buyer customer? Yes. Yeah, that's what dual agency says. This agent, and this, and thank you, Sean, so much for putting yourself out there. This agent, you're partly right. This agent did everything right. They in no way tried to create agency. They explained to this buyer where they stand. They told them they didn't know them confidentiality. They didn't show it as a buyer's agent. They showed it as a seller sub-agent. Seller sub-agency, the buyer's your customer. In this scenario, I know a couple of you saying we didn't get the seller's permission. We did because the seller said no clients no buyer clients of the firm 
So what that leaves them with, another firm's buyer clients or our buyer customer. In this scenario, this agent did everything right. Had they attempted to create agency, now we got a problem. Had they not explained it to the buyer, now we got a problem. You guys see, once the seller said no, that limited our pool of buyers. It limited the buyers that our firm can work with. That's what it means to say no to dual agency. Now, we've already said, if this buyer wants to be hired and they want representation, can I go back and have a conversation with the seller? Can I revisit dual agency? Sure. I think the scenario we gave last week, if you have a seller, they sign the listing agreement and they say no to dual, and then maybe their home has been on the market for nine months with little to no interest. And then all of a sudden you have a buyer client interested. Aren't they going to be more likely to change their mind to dual? Aren't they going to say, my God, I'll do whatever. I don't care. Just get this thing sold. So we can always revisit dual agency. If they've said no in writing, we got to change it in writing. Let's look at another scenario. Again, take just a few minutes to read it. I would agree with that. So we have another listing agreement that does not allow dual agency. The seller has said no. A broker in the company is working with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement. The buyer now wants to see one or more of the company's listings, including the one that the seller said no to dual agency. As it stands right now at this moment with what we're looking at on the screen, can I show the buyer this property as it stands right now? Can I show this buyer this property? I love all these heads shaking no, because you're absolutely right. Because the seller has said no to Dole. Can I go back and revisit this with the seller? Can I say, are you sure? I got a client. Now they want to see it. You want to change your mind? I can't make them change their mind, but I, can I revisit it with them? Things might look a little different now than what they did when you list it. Also, before I can show it, I also got to get an oral dual agency agreement. I got an oral buyer agency agreement, and I'll have to get the seller to change their mind, and I'll have to get the buyer's oral consent to do dual, and then I can show the property. But as it stands just like this, no, I can't because the seller has said no. So somebody said in the chat, you're absolutely right. The agent must tell the buyer that she cannot show the property, dual agency is not allowed. Maybe advised to go to another firm. Ooh, I, you, I, uh, as your broker in charge, I don't like that. I don't want my client to go to your firm, to another firm, right? Now, is that a possibility? I, I mean, maybe, but as a broker in charge, I'm not letting my clients go away just willy nilly. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to try to make this thing work first. That may come up in a sales meeting next week. <laughs> That's how I put in. That's what we're going to talk about over, over bagels. Okay. <laughs> One more situation.
Okay, so now we got a listing agreement that authorizes dual and designated. I got a buyer agency agreement in writing that does not authorize dual. But now, lo and behold, our buyer wants to see this company's listing. As it stands right now, can I show this to the buyer? As it stands right now, can I show the buyer? And I'm seeing in the chat, I'm seeing heads, no, I can't. Why? Because the buyer has said no. It's not me saying no. It's the buyer that has said no. Can I go back and revisit it with the buyer? If they really, really want to see it, might they be apt to change their mind? Can I make them change their mind? No, but we can always revisit it. And guys, keep in mind, once something is in writing, the only way to change it is by changing it in writing. So when your buyer says, yeah, Julie, whatever, we'll do dual agency. Is that phone call sufficient? Can I get them to change their mind because they told me? No, I got to get them to change it in writing and then I can see it. So let's see, agent needs buyer to change your mind. I agree in writing. Thank you for adding that. Can't see any of the firm's properties as it stands right now. Does it happen a lot that if they say no, they go to another firm? Once they sign with me, <laughs> once we're in writing, they just can't go to another firm. They gotta be released. Remember that's one way we can terminate agencies by mutual agreement, but it's not your agency agreement. Whose agency agreement is it? It's the firm's, it's mine. Am I just gonna release that buyer? I don't know, every firm's different, every BIC's different, every situation's different. As a BIC, I'm gonna try to keep my clients in-house, right? Things to think about. There's some other situations in your book, I'm sure you guys have been through. Um, like pages 176, there's some good stuff. Oh, there's a few other ones. Those situations, I had you guys cross out situation two on number or page 162, but situation one, situation three, those are good. Spend some time. All right, now I got some questions for you guys. Y'all got your private chat set? Everybody ready? Here's a question for you. I hear from everybody. When we ask questions, I like to hear from everybody. It's probably that group participation thing. Everybody in? Okay. So the question is, the commission's working with real estate agents is a mandatory disclosure. Must it be given in all? brokerage transactions at first substantial contact. Do we do it for all, each and every single one of them? No, only sales transactions. There's sales transactions and there's lease transactions and then there's all, which is sales and lease. If you're feeling like they're trying to trick you, you're right. This is why we're trying to work the kinks out now before the test. Do I have questions on this one? Sales, not lease, thus, not all.
It's a big word to be so little, isn't it? That was fun. Here's another private chat. Yes or no? Does the working with, did I hear from anybody? Stop chat, chat stop. Two more coming in. You good? Does the working with real estate agent disclosure apply to commercial sales transaction? Yes, sales is sales whether you're doing residential sales, ooh, some of you just uttered some four letter words, whether you're doing residential sales, <laughs> I can read mouse, or you're doing commercial sales, sales is sales. It's about whether or not you're working with the buyer and the seller. That's what we mean by sales. Whether you're doing for a residential home or commercial property, you're working with buyers and sellers. Questions? The next slide is very exciting. You guys ready? Ready, the anticipation? Did we ever think we'd see this at the end of unit seven? We did it, you guys. That's a tough one, isn't it? How long have we been in unit seven? <laughs> A lot of information. <laughs> There's those key terms way back on page 131. Your key point review, good summary, sum up unit seven, student quiz. I got some other stuff in the online learning system I'm gonna show you in just a second. You can find some of this in the license law and commission rule comments that we introduced you guys to last week that we asked you to start reading now. Unit seven is deep, it's thick. It's a lot of red stars. You're gonna get a lot of test questions. Again, I got some other resources. By the way, um, real quick, remember when we introduced you guys to the comments, I told you guys to stay away from Appendix A because Appendix A was out of date. So I pointed you to a couple different resources. There is a quiz at the end of Appendix A, uh, page 737. Jot that down with your notes, 737. The quiz is okay. The quiz is okay. You may have a question or two, but for the most part, the quiz is okay. So once you read those comments online, then you can look at the quiz. Look at all these page numbers. Anybody not have the page numbers? Okay. Just a few things in our online learning system in the unit seven material. Uh, we've looked at our working with real estate agent disclosure. You can see, I mean, again, here's another description on buyer agency, dual agent, designated dual agent. Um, I recommend you guys looking at this Q&A brochure, kind of another way to help introduce you to agency. I also have these documents in here. They're called Summary of Important Points. And I got one for material facts and I got one for agency. This is like material facts and agency in bulleted form. Uh, these came from, this was our last year CE material. 
So I think I've mentioned a few times that sometimes in our continuing education classes each year, these topics that we discuss in pre-licensing and post-licensing pop back up again in CE because it's important that the commission keeps reminding us the proper ways to handle agency, the proper ways to handle material facts. So with that said, just last year, material facts and agency were topics that popped up in CE. So I put them in here for you guys. Help it all click. The other thing I want to show you that I put in here is a sample oral buyer agency letter. So remember, we've created oral buyer agency through an express agreement, which means we don't have anything in writing yet, but the terms have been clearly stated. So some firms may have, some firms may suggest that you use when you're creating oral buyer agency, that you use this form. This is you documenting the conversation about creating oral buyer agency. And we're telling the buyer, I'm gonna act as your buyer's agent. I'm gonna assist you in locating. Um, the agreement is non-exclusive. Uh, if you become interested, the firm may represent both. We're gonna talk about dual agency. And then you'll note only the agent signs this. I'm not asking the buyer to sign anything. If I was going to ask the buyer to sign something, it would be the written agency agreement. But for whatever reason, we're not asking them to sign yet. But we still have to create that express agreement. Express meaning we clearly state the term. So this is just meant to serve as an example of something that you may follow up with after you create that oral buyer agency agreement. It clearly states the terms. Remember, I'm a big fan of letting the forms put words in your mouth. So those are the things that we have for you guys in unit seven. I guess, again, lots of ways to help you guys wrap your brains around this. You're not gonna hear what I've been talking about in class and be prepared to pass the test on agency. It just doesn't work that way. Study it, go back, read the book, read the letter, read the Q&A. You've got to spend some time with it. Another resource, oh, I'm not done yet. Wait, there's more. Another resource, we kind of introduced you guys to the Real Estate Commission's website, maybe last week, week before, uh, ncrec.gov. And remember, we looked at this on the homepage, and here's our license law and rule. Uh, we're going to look at a few other things, but, you know, the commission's main purpose is to protect the public. And one way that they can protect the public is to help educate the public. So they make this stuff available. They make this material available for the public to find. And I don't want you guys spending all of your study time on the commission's website. But I do think it's important that you know it's here. Maybe you poke around a little bit. I think in particular, the two big tabs for you guys to pay attention to are the publications tabs and the resources tabs. You know, something's interesting to you, click on it. If we're going to talk about it, we're going to, I mean, we're not going to talk about military resources, for example. But some of this stuff, uh, fair housing, we'll get to. Under the resources tab, you see down here at the very bottom, we have a video library. Everybody with me? So resources, video library. And the commission has produced several different videos for, you know, different people. And one of their video library categories is for brokers. And when we look at the videos, again, some of these apply to your exams, some of them don't. But the very first videos that they offer, there's a working with real estate agents directed towards the seller. And there is a working with real estate agents directed towards the buyer. Now we're going to look at the buyer video together. But I think you guys should look at the seller video too. And I think you can look at both of these again, because it's another way to introduce you to the different types of agency that we have to offer. This is a really good wrap up of unit seven. So we're gonna look at the buyer video together, but you go to resources and video library to look at both on your own time. So 
Are you considering buying a house or other real estate? If so, you may want a real estate agent to guide you through the process. Here at the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, we want you to understand the different ways you can work with an agent when buying real estate and the services agents can provide. You have several choices about how a real estate firm and its agents will work with you. For example, you may want them to represent only you as a buyer agent, or you may be willing to allow them to represent both you and the seller at the same time as a dual agent. You might even prefer to be unrepresented and work directly with the seller's agent. Some brokers will offer you a choice of these services, and others may not. Whether you choose to work with a buyer agent, dual agent, or seller's agent, that agent must treat you honestly and fairly and tell you about any material facts that the agent knows about or should know about that could influence your decisions in the transaction. The Real Estate Commission has developed a disclosure form called Working with Real Estate Agents to help you understand the different kinds of agency relationships. The form emphasizes the importance of not sharing confidential information with an agent until you know the agent represents you. The Real Estate Commission requires every real estate agent to review this disclosure form with you and to ask you to sign it before receiving any confidential information from you or assisting with your purchase. The Working with Real Estate Agents disclosure is not a contract. Signing it does not obligate you to work with the agent who presented it to you. Your signature is just an acknowledgement that you've received the disclosure form. The Commission also publishes a brochure entitled Questions and Answers on Working with Real Estate Agents. Now, this brochure explains what a real estate agent's duties are, what services your agent will provide for you, and how the agent will be paid. You can download the brochure for free from the Commission's website at ncrec.gov. If you choose to have a buyer agent or firm represent you, they owe you certain duties. First, the firm and its agents must promote your best interest ahead of all others. They must be loyal to you, follow your lawful instructions, and give you information about the property that could influence your purchasing decisions. Your agent must also use reasonable skill, care, and diligence throughout the process and account for all money they receive on your behalf. Once you've agreed that a firm or agent will represent you, they may not give certain confidential information about you to the seller or the seller's agents without your permission. Confidential information includes your motivation for buying or your negotiating strategy. For this reason, don't tell the agent anything that you don't want a seller to know until you enter into an agreement to hire the agent. A buyer agent will help you find a suitable property, gather more information about properties you're interested in, prepare and submit an offer, order inspections, and prepare for closing. A buyer agent may be paid in different ways. Often, the agent will seek payment from the seller or listing firm first, but if the seller and listing firm refuse, then you may have to pay the buyer agent yourself. You and the agent will address the firm's fees in the written buyer agency agreement. So be sure to read and understand any agency agreement before you sign it and make sure it includes any promises that the agent has made to you. You'll also be asked to indicate in the buyer agency agreement if the firm you're hiring would be allowed to participate in dual agency. Dual agency is when the firm that represents you also represents the seller at the same time. This is most likely to happen if your buyer agent's firm has a listing agreement with the owner of a property that you want to purchase. In a dual agency situation, the firm and its agents owe equal obligations to you and the seller rather than only representing your interests. Because of this, your agent may lose their ability to advise, counsel, or advocate for either party. In order to reduce the conflict of interest inherent in dual agency, some real estate firms may offer a type of dual agency called designated dual agency. And this is where one agent within the firm is designated to represent only you, 
and another agent within the firm is designated to represent only the seller. Neither agent should have confidential information about the other party at the time of designation. This type of dual agency allows you and the seller to be more fully represented because it allows your agent to advise you and to negotiate and advocate for you. For more information about the duties and responsibilities of real estate agents, visit the Commission's website at ncrec.gov and click on the Publications tab or just give us a call. videos, online learning system, book, YouTube channel. Right. I, I would consider, I mean, seven and eight, unit seven and eight are both about agency. Uh, we've defined agency. We've talked about the different types of agency. Now in unit eight, we're going to talk about the agency contracts, the agency agreements. We're actually going to look at our forms. Um, we're going to talk about specifically working with sellers, specifically working with buyers. So we've already created agency. We did our disclosure. We created agency. Now what? And this is more where we're going with unit eight. So our roadmap for unit eight, we're going to explain our agency contracts. We're going to talk about something called the North Carolina Residential Property Disclosure Act, who has to follow it, what they have to do, all that. We're going to talk about working specifically with sellers. We're going to talk about working specifically with buyers. And then at the end of unit eight, we get to whip our calculators back out again. Y'all miss your calculator? Don't worry, we'll have them back out. But in unit eight, we get to do fun math because at the end of unit eight, we get to figure out your money, figure out commission math. The other piece of math that we're going to do in unit eight is seller net. Do you think, you can shake your head yes or no, do you think it's common at some point for a seller to look at you and say, if you sell my house for X amount, how much am I going to make? When you sell my house, how much am I going to make? You think that's a common question? <laughs> yeah, because isn't that what they're doing? Selling a house makes money, right? What they make is referred to as seller net. And because we know that question's common, that's math. That we get to learn to do. So the math in unit eight is our commission and seller net, helping our sellers determine how much we're going to put in their pocket at the end of this transaction. So before we jump in the book, as a quick reminder, we talked about, we're going to start seeing these terms more, these bottom terms more, now that we're getting into our agency agreement. So remember we talked about the people working with the buyer. They could be referred to as the buyer's agent, the buyer's firm. They could also be referred to as the selling agent and the selling firm. Selling is the verbiage we're going to see on our contracts. So we need to know who that agent is. They are selling it to the buyer. Compare that to those working with the seller, the seller's agent, the seller's firm. Again, on our contracts, we're going to have them referred to as the listing agent and the listing firm. So particularly with the selling and the seller, it's really important we hear and see the ing versus the er. So on page 188, 
we talk about, introduce you to the idea of our agency contracts, all of our written agency agreements, written agency agreements must, everybody see that word must? It's an important word. All of our written agency agreements must be signed by all parties. The client is going to sign, the buyer or the seller is going to sign, and then the agent is going to sign on behalf of the firm. My firm allows me to sign their agency agreements because the agent is the one that's going to sign it. Agency agreements must include your license number. There's that six digit number again that you need to know. If you sign it as an agent, <laughs> you need a license number with it. Our agency agreements have to have a definite termination date. We can't have this open-ended agreement. We have to have a definite date. How long do we have our agency agreements? It just depends. Uh, your firm may have a policy. The market may dictate how long we have our agency agreements. Last year, we didn't need listing agreements for long, did we? Month, maybe two, we got these suckers out. Have you guys ever heard of the housing market crash in 2008, 2009, 2010? It was not a good time to be in real estate. We needed agency agreements for longer because listings were hanging out for longer. We had them for longer. So how long we have the agency agreement, it just depends. Again, your firm may have a policy, uh, market conditions may dictate, but either way, we have to have a definite termination date. We can agree to extend it, but if we don't extend it when it's over, it's over. A couple of you made me nervous. A couple of you ready to send the buyer down the street to another firm. Again, asking them, allowing them to get out of the contract before our expiration date is going to be up to the firm, is going to be up to the bit. We can't just let them go down the street. That's not up to us, that's up to the bit. So we gotta, everybody's gotta honor this agreement through the end. And then our, um, our other must for agent written agency agreements, we have to have the non-discrimination clause. The non-discrimination clause says that the agent nor the firm are going to discriminate against any of the protected classes. And it does actually list the protected classes. We'll see the non-discrimination clause probably tomorrow night when we look at our, look at our listing agreement. Uh, remember, I got a whole unit dedicated to fair housing. So we're gonna talk more about those protected classes, who they are and how we best represent and protect them. What we're understanding right now is our written agency agreements have that clause that says we will not discriminate against any of the protected classes. The different types of agency agreements that we may encounter. We have the listing agreement. The listing agreement is what the seller uses to hire the firm. Buyer's agency agreement. The buyer's using to hire the firm to help them purchase, locate a property. A property management agreement. The owner is hiring the property manager to manage their property. Please understand, when we're being hired by the clients, the job that we're hired to do is very specific. So if the seller hires us, they're hiring us to help them list and sell their property. They're not hiring us to be their little, you know, person that they can demand. Like we're not going to have to go over there and mow their yard on Saturday and clean their house, that kind of thing. That's not what we're being hired to do. We're being hired to help them list, market, and sell their home. It's very specific. Our agency agreements are very specific about our responsibilities, about our roles. One thing I really want everybody to understand when it comes to our agency agreements, our agency agreements are employment contracts. We're using the agency agreement for the client to hire us to do a specific job. And because it's an employment contract, it needs to discuss how 
and when I expect to get paid. This is one of the big reasons why we use an agency agreement is so when you've done the job that they hired you to do, make sure you get your compensation, make sure you get paid. Our agency agreements, the second bullet is probably a problem topic too. Our agency agreements must be in writing at the beginning with owners. Maybe it's sellers in a for sale situation, maybe it's owners in a for lease and you're going in as a property management. There is no such thing as oral seller agency. The only relationship that can be oral at first is with the buyer. I cannot perform a single service for an owner without first entering into an agency agreement. So then the question comes up, why use a listing agreement? Well, we already said employment contract to help you solidify your commission. That's one good reason, right? The other good reason why we may use listing agreements is to create inventory. Once we use our listing agreements to have the client hire us, within our listing agreement gives us permission to put their listing in the multiple listing services. Now we've danced all around the MLS. We're actually going to meet it tomorrow. Be exciting. But with the multiple listing services, we are creating an inventory. Um, as a salesman, I need a product to sell. Not a very good salesman if I don't have anything for sale, right? And while the individual agent or the individual firm may not have a product, by all of us putting our listings into MLS, we're pulling our inventory. We're pulling our inventory together. So now me personally, I currently don't have a listing agreement with anybody. So what do I personally have to sell? Nothing. But because I'm a member of the MLS, because we can all pull our listings together and create this inventory, at last look, I have like 2,500 act, 2, active listings. That's what a salesman need is inventory. That's what I need as a product. And that's a really big reason why we use MLS and we use these listing agreements to get that property in so we can find buyers for our sellers. Questions so far? So don't go anywhere, but we are at a good stopping place. So when we come back tomorrow, uh, we're gonna pick back up, we're over here on page 189. So we're gonna talk about different ways that we can solicit, how do we get the business, buyers and sellers, we're gonna talk about that. Um, please look with me real quick, page 194. One ninety four is our sample agency ag listing agreement. Page two hundred five is our sample buyer agency. Do not look at the forms in your book. Those forms in your book are out of date. So whenever we're going to go look at forms, we're always going to go to the online learning system. You guys, I think, have a note in your book that says. The current form is 2022. Do you got like a little box or something at the top? Some of you have a newer version of a book than I do. I'm not quite sure how you have a newer book than I do, but here we are. So what I know is that the forms in the book are out of date and the current is always going to be available for you guys in Learn Test Pass. So that's what we'll look at tomorrow night. So keep going through unit eight. We probably won't get to the math tomorrow, which means we'll get to start that on Thursday night. So don't fear the math just yet. We're building up to it. But look ahead. All of Unit 8 will be covered before the week is over. That's all I got. Y'all have a great night. We'll see everybody tomorrow at 530 and we'll do it again. Good night.